Good evening from Sweden and good day in Los Angeles. Uh, very welcome to WIFTI Worldwide Webinar. It's hosted by WIFTI International and WIFT is an organization that started in Los Angeles in the 70s because of the dominance of men in the industry. And we are still there, so we continue. We exist in about 50 places all around the globe and we are about 20,000 members. Since six weeks back, we have done this concept with the worldwide webinar. We started in Iceland, went to Canada, then to UK, to Australia, and to India. And today, I'm very happy to welcome you to Los Angeles and two beautiful ladies. Please write your names and where you're from in the commenting field. And there is also a box where we <clears throat> where you can write your questions and I'm so happy to welcome Jess Konoplia, who is the moderator of today. Jess is the president of Association of Film Commissions International, AFCI, and her fantastic guest today. It's a big honor and a big joy to welcome Jeanette Bultorno from Catchlight Studios. Very welcome, ladies, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, it's been quite a long time since the three of us were together. I realized it was, you know, it was in Petersburg, Russia, September last year with an AFCI conference. And when I did the maths, I realized it's been nine months since we were together in person. And my new rule is that if it takes enough time to create a human being between you've actually, <laughs> between when you've seen someone in person, it's far too long. So I hope we can um, rectify that sometime soon when, you know, the world settles down but um you know a lot has changed yeah a lot has changed in in the last nine months um it, it's great to see that both of you are well and i hope that everyone else who is tuning into this is is safe and well too um it's a huge pleasure to be moderating this session um Jeanette you not only wear many hats but the thing that I find especially inspiring about you is that you are the creator of many of those hats. Um, you know, just putting aside your time with Mill Film in London uh, and looking at the creation of Catchlight Films back in 1999, which is now uh, morphed into Catchlight Studios in, in 2019. Um, you moved to Blumhouse in 2012 uh, and you were involved with 60 feature films, including the Academy Award winning uh, Whiplash and Get Out. You've produced seven franchises, um, you know, were one of uh, the co-founders of the Women's Production Society, which is a, a phenomenal powerhouse group here in LA that really strives to promote women into, into leadership roles within the screen sector. You also launched the Catch a Break podcast back in 2019, which, you know, has a very philanthropic outlook. It's designed to help people who are trying to get into the industry or move up in the industry. Um, and now we have Kruvi, which I have to say AFCI is very proud to call an industry partner. Um, this, this platform was developed by a, an all women team and it's really designed to shine a spotlight on crew, on diverse crew around the world. It helps producers create their ideal crew list um, and, in, and includes diversity metrics in it, which no other database to my knowledge does. Um, and I think it's incredibly important at this, at this time in particular, uh, as we're managing the COVID pandemic among many other issues, that diversity has to be something that stays at the table, that there's no opportunity for it to, it to leave the table. So, I mean, before we jump into Kruvi, I, it's it's really clear to me that you are you are motivated to make changes in the industry. How how is it that you have an intense day job, a lot of the one you've had at Blumhouse, and you you come home at the end of the day? I mean, not that the day ever really ends when you're in in the role that you were in as head of production, but then you find the time to say, here are some issues in the industry that I'm passionate about and I want to fix. Um, what motivates you and, and where do you find the time and the energy to, to create these things? I think it's the, the people around me and the teams that I have. I, I, really, um, I really like daydreaming and thinking about 
the way that it could be, the way that it should be, the way that I would love for it to be. And, I, and from that, I kind of architect, okay, well, gosh, it's not that difficult if we took these steps or we put these things in place and maybe we can do that. And I've been fortunate enough to work in the independent space, which I think um, I, had a, I had a stint at some of the studios back in the early days working in visual effects. And um, it's great working with the studios. It's, there's, there's definitely a piece to that that works for it and that you learn from. But in the indie space, you have more freedom and with the freedom comes the responsibility and the um, and the, the the opportunity to change things. You're not so held to a particular structure that you need to follow, and um, you you realize that you can actually make those changes and those pivots. So then, when you start thinking about like, wow, why do we do it this way, or why isn't there a tool for this, or or something, you know, you kind of think, okay, well. It can't be that hard. And that's how we dreamt up Kruvi. You know, I was literally uh, sitting with my girlfriend who was line producing a project and, you know, she had to drop into a place that she'd never been before and find a crew and start filming within six weeks. And with that notion, we were like, well, how, how do you find these people that, um, can be recommended that are that are interested that are willing that are available that have the skill sets you know all of those pieces that you're looking for and then I also realized well at, at Blumhouse I was in a hiring position and I, and when I was a line producer I realized it as as well I was in a hiring position where I could actually make some changes and then I I really like when someone puts a parameter on something and I read like, okay, here are the rules and here are what you have to follow. Okay, but it doesn't say I can't do that. Or it doesn't say I can't do this. What if, what if we could try this? And so that is exciting. And that's why we built Kruby because we were literally thinking, well, if it doesn't exist, we need it. And if we need it, then other people need it. And, mm. and it just, it comes out of dreaming. It's that inspiration of like, I know that I know that it can be better. I know that it can be different. And if you put that vision board up there and you take the steps and break it down to figure out how to do it and enroll other people who are as passionate and as committed at creating something or changing something and have that same vision, then you can slowly move that boulder up the hill and get things done and put it out there. So that's, I think. That's fantastic, and and you're right. I mean, there are there are a multitude of crew lists out there, but very few. And we'll we'll dive into this. Enable people to identify themselves in certain ways, and I think this is one of the one of the challenges that we have too in determining how representative crews are, because on hiring forms you're required to enter certain data, but there's no requirement. Um, legally, there cannot be a requirement for you to disclose information about yourself. And so with Kruvi, it is completely voluntary. Uh, yeah. But there are multiple categories that you can choose to identify with. And I think that's, I mean, th there's nothing else out there that is, that is like that. So how, how did you find your team? I mean, you have this idea, this kernel that we want to create this database, you have a partner to develop this database with, and then you have to actually develop it. How do you find people that you trust that you not have the skills because if look i am not uh you know technologically technologically especially savvy i can work my way around an excel excel spreadsheet and updated you know a website from the back end but much more than that um how did you find the right partners now you you um you ask around a lot marcy brown is my is my business partner in this and she's the the line producer that was working with me on the project where we were see a need fill a need and decided to create this so we literally took pieces of paper and drew like, okay, you know, you want to search by this and you want to search by this, but wouldn't it be cool if it had this detail and this detail and detail and this detail? And we took a bunch of different pieces of paper and then started asking all of our friends, who do you know that does coding? Who do you know that builds databases? Who do you know that does this? And we had a list of about seven different people that we had come up with that people had recommended. And we took various meetings and um, we got 
you know, some crazy ranges of like how long it would take and how much it would cost. And yeah. we were bootstrapping this by ourselves. And we were like, oh God, like, how are we going to do this? We don't want to raise the money. We, you know, we want to kind of do it like grassroots. And uh, one day I was driving in my little town in LA. I'm in this little suburb called El Segundo. It's tiny. And I drove by this place and I was like, what's that? <laughs> so I called Marcy and I was like, you need to call this place. I have this sixth sense. And I don't know if it's like a female intuition or whatever, but she called and she, she got them on the phone and they were two Filipino women who had immigrated to the United States who have a wonderful company called Westside Websites who do the backend databases for large studios. And they normally don't work for the public. They, it's a, they're very much a back-end engine. And they teach right. a class called Wonder Women Coders where they teach women how to code for websites. And they're very much about women empowerment. And so they heard Marcy's pitch on the phone and they were like, all right, come in and talk to us. And so we, <laughs> we went in and started telling them like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? Wouldn't it be cool if we do that? And they went, you know what? We see your vision. Like, we'll, we'll help you with this. And because we had such a great rapport working with them, we made them a partner in our company and built it all together. And so Marcy and I would be like dreaming about stuff and they would figure out how to make our wacky thing requests. Could That's you, amazing. Could you do this? Uh, okay, well, hang on, let's see, you know? And so we just did it all grassroots. That's remarkable. I love that story of driving by and just asking Marcy to try and check out our place. How, how phenomenal. And the fact that it was run by, you know, the two women who, you know, I've had the pleasure of meeting and they're incredibly on it. Um, I wanted to, to just talk briefly. I listened to the podcast that you did a couple of weeks ago, Happier in Hollywood. And there was a very interesting story you told about, you know, IATSE and, and how you have to go around your, the certain sort of recruitment process. And I'm conscious of the fact that I know we will have listeners that, that tune in from different countries around the world where union structures are different. Could you explain a little bit about how the hiring process works? I'm thinking of you in, a, in maybe in, a, in the independent film space um, and what the regulations are and perhaps they, those regulations are important, but how there can be challenges to bring people in and bring, move people up. Sure. So um, in the United States, we have a, uh, a union organization called IATSE, and the majority of the crew, probably 80% of the crew, work under uh, the IATSE contracts when you're working union. And if you're a production company or a studio, you usually sign a um, an overall deal with them, which lasts for generally three years. The contract periods usually last three years. And in that deal, it states that you will hire a union member first before anything else. And of course, if you're in a strange place and you need somebody and nobody's there and, you know, there's certain loopholes where you can bring somebody in. But for the most part, you are committing that you are, you know, hiring union. To get into the union, you either do it a, a, a couple of different ways. One is you can get grandfathered in on an independent production that signs you up and then turns union. Um, or you can do uh, certain training trade programs and come in as a craftsman under um, certain programs. Um, or you can get lucky and you know collect certain days on, uh, it's not really lucky, but you are working hard, but yep. <laughs> on other, on other um, projects and collect your 30 days in order to be eligible to get in. But, um, you know, a lot, the bulk of the work in the United States is union work. And so if you're, the, the independent world is so small now that getting on a show that flips union is hard. It's very challenging to do that. And, um, and these union shows have pledged that they're going to hire a union because that's the point. And when you right. sign this overall deal, you get slightly uh, better rates, right? So you, there's an incentive for a company to become union and, and uphold the rules that take care of the workers. So um, the catch-22 on the union side has always been it's impossible to bring diversity up into the system because you're upholding a union contract. Here's the catch 22, like I'm supposed to hire a union, but I need more diversity. And so, um, and this, and it's slightly that way on the, on the director's guild side too, on the DGA side, because you have to um, hire people who have certain qualifications who 
gone up the ranks right. and worked in there for a certain amount of days and years. And, and, um, but on the lower budget projects, they allow you to bring in people who are not into the guild or who have less days to work on particular lower budget projects. So the lower budget independent area is the area that I play in a lot because mm -hmm. you can create a little freely. And that's the area where you can take somebody who was in one position and they maybe started off here, but they really want to be over here and you can move them or you can bring in a new person or you can, you know, you can kind of change it up a little bit. So we, um, you know, the, I was invited to the table for the union contract negotiations for IATSE in November. And they, um, they really hear what's going on in the world. And they were committed yeah. to helping us make a change. And um, they allowed a piece of language to be put in for the lower budget contracts that make it easier for people who are upholding the contracts and uh, are a signator, union signatory company that on the low budget films, you can bring in one person per project in any category that you want, but just one person on the show. Um, and as long as they've come up through one of the, the training programs or, or are somewhat qualified in what it is that you're, you're doing um, and make them union. And that's a game changer because now we can start pulling in people who are who have gone through AFCI or whatever other programs that are out there and um, and put them onto the shows that we're working on. So that's yeah. brilliant. That's I mean, it, it seems like a small thing. But as you say, I mean, I think in the podcast, you, you mentioned maybe you were working on, you know, 15 or so feature films a year. There's 15 opportunities that, and it's. Uh, you know, it's not thousands, but it's absolutely a start. And so, you know, but if you bounce it, over, like all of the other stuff too, it really makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's massive. Um, with respect to Kruby, walk walk me through how the, the process works. I know, I mean, the, the goal is that we have more and more people actually registered as as crew members on Kruby. Um, the, the bigger the database is, the the you know more opportunities there are for everyone. Um, walk me through how how the the system works. We wanted to make something that was um, for the people uh, and by the people. And by that I mean when you come in and you log in and you sign up for it, you choose how you want to be known by. If you want to be known as a woman who speaks Spanish, who has a passport, who is a veteran, who whatever, 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 you can. If you don't want to be known as being over 40 or being um, black or being LGBTQ or you don't have to, you can be, hmm. some people just want to be the best camera operator and that's it. And other people want to be seen as I'm a woman, I want to be searched by that because I know people are looking for women in that. And that is what calls to me and who I want to be and put out there. So, you know, a lot of the lists that people have been gathering over the past couple of years, especially with the Me Too movement and Time's Up and everything, um, are literally lists of people. And you get put on a list whether or not you like it and you're categorized and put on a list by your gender, your race, your age, your what, whatever it is, right? And those lists get passed around. And if you don't make it on that list, then you're excluded from being a part right. of that whole community that's being passed around. Whereas if you have a global database that's shared by everybody and you can search anybody, anywhere, in any country under whatever parameters they want to be searched by and you want to search by, it's a game changer because it's it's a way to be able to find people when you're when a show is going to a location or traveling to a location and wants to bring somebody with them like when we shot um fantasy island in fiji we brought somebody from south africa we brought somebody from singapore yeah. we brought somebody like we brought people in from other parts of the world because they fit the criteria of what it was we were looking for on that show. So it's the same thing when other uh, shows are filming around the world or even local territories that if they wanna find a balance and they're looking for, oh, you know, we, we wanna see if we can find a few more women to fill out 
these departments or a department head for a particular thing or somebody who has this particular skill set maybe somebody you can have like pieces of equipment that you own on there or like all sorts of various things that you can customize to put in there to let people know what your yeah your, i mean that's huge it goes beyond your name and your credits yes uh, and even i mean i because i've had the privilege of having a little look at the back end too i mean it, you can list your availability uh, as well that's you huge. can and that's you know we're in conversations with a lot of um large studios and, and production companies. And one of the things that really made it appealing to them was there's an interactive calendar that's on there. And people can go in and, you know, we're trying to get crew and craftsmen to understand that it's not just about signing up once and then don't come back. Interact with it and make sure that you're completely up to date on yeah. your profile and your availability because you, I can say, um, I want a costume designer and they need to be available from this day to this day. And the database will use what I'm using in my search criteria to tell me who's available in that particular part of the world with those particular skills and find that. And I know from a producer's point of view, uh, if I'm looking through the database, there are some fantastic functions that let me actually see how diverse the crew you know, my list is. Um, can you yeah. can you walk us through that a little bit? Because I, I found that to be just uh, just brilliant. Yeah, I mean, we there are things that we're building as well, and some some pretty cool tools. We have a crew list that we're putting on there. Um, you can start with a dream team, and you can assemble your team together, and and then you can turn that dream team into the crew list, and that crew list becomes live, and you can share it with everybody that's on your crew, and it'll give you the statistics of how many women you hired, how many uh, veterans you hired, how many you know particular uh, classifications of whatever uh, you know diversity or. Um, uh, physically challenged or, or um, LGBTQ, whatever. And you can use that data for the film commissions that you're working with when you're um, showing the diversity of the, the people that you've hired from the region and socioeconomics. And it's really quite handy when you get to look at the bigger picture of it and see the impact that you're having with um, the people that are coming together and telling the story, you know? Yeah. And, you know, from AFCI's point of view, we, we want to encourage our members, our film commission members around the world to encourage their crew to, to list and encourage their local producers to be able to use this tool because, you know, this is not a tool that's created for, for California or the US. This is a global, a global tool and we want crew everywhere to be listing themselves and we want producers everywhere to be, to be diving in and using it because it will, you know, it, it is, as we say, it's, it's unique. It's the only it's the only crew list out there that gives you such incredible uh, sort of searching power. And then the, the sort of analytics, that was something that really blew me away uh, was that I could see as I was pulling together my crew, Oh, you know, I've, I've just employed, I'm looking to employ all men at this point. I should probably okay. consider tweaking that because it, I think there are so many positions when you're pulling your crew together. Um, it's easy to sort of forget uh, or just, no, there's nothing that really sits and tallies for you is what I'm saying. Forget it's the wrong word, but there's no tally that's ongoing and, and Kruby does provide that, that function. Um, yeah. there, there is a slight, you know, some people may choose not to, to tag themselves. It's a particular thing. So there's always going to sure. be a little bit of a fudge uh, thing in there. Yeah. We, we work with organizations and help ingest some of their data and then help give them back data of, you know, who who is in their region and what you know what are their stats in their region and you know so it's it's quite fun when you get to break it down and you go okay there's we've made a lot of improvement here or here's where we need to make improvement you know? yeah yeah and where i mean afci is releasing tomorrow a report that we just did in conjunction with uh, the times up foundation around diversity focusing on commissions around the world and the the various uh programs that they have in place um everything from you know not even programs to be honest from from the low-hanging fruit of listing to to groups like um Wifty, uh 
because th that doesn't sort of cost anything. It's having a page on your website where you share information, share information about WIFTI and about Cruvy and about other you know, local organizations too that are in the diversity space through to you know, funding initiatives. Uh, and at the, at the high end, having a, a full-time person in-house to commission who's focused on diversity. Um, yeah. But, you know, everyone has a role to play here. And, and I, you know, I sort of keep saying, especially at, at this time when we are mid pandemic coming out of pandemic, you know, we're, we're all in this sort of wave together in the wave pool um, in the monk, in amongst all of the priorities that we have around health, we, we cannot lose focus on this particular issue. It absolutely must stay at the table. So um, you know, I'm incredibly, um, I'm incredibly excited about what it is that you've created. And I know you have a, a session with, uh, with Delay coming up to sort yeah. of walk through Kruvi. Can you um, please feel free to promote that one for a little bit? Because I think it would be great to share with, uh, with um, the audience. Yeah, it's coming up at the end of the month. I would definitely check on the website and, and their newsletters to find out the exact day and time just to make sure that, that it, it, it sticks. Um, but it's a session where we're going to talk through um, all of the different areas that you can fill out when you sign up and what it means when you're filling these things out and how to actually get the most out of it and then how to be interactive with it. So we're excited to, to do a live demo of how do you get in, how do you sign up, how do you use it? You know, there's, there's places to put all of your um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you know, all of your social handles and stuff. You can put your links to your reels. If you have reels, you can put photos, you can put, so it's, it kind of acts as a website for people. Um, it links yeah. to your IMDb. You have one. What I particularly like is one of the um, uh, pieces that we put in there recently was people that are starting off in the industry that, um, haven't made a name for themselves and are trying to move up into it. They may they might start off as a production assistant or or a, an assistant or some sort of a, a lower entry level thing. But what they're really aspiring to be is this. And so, if especially if they're in a diverse classification, if they can put you know, I'm working as this, but I'm aspiring as this, because aspiring is a key word that we have in there. I'm aspiring to be a director of photography or a director or a writer or a, whatever it is in there, then people can search under you and see, oh, okay, I can hire that person right now for this. And when I'm crewing up for that next project, look, they hit all the classifications of what it is that I'm looking for. And I want to give that person a shot, aspiring, blah, blah, blah. Then I will, you know, look for them. So that's a big piece of the, the puzzle right now. That's um, huge. I mean, it strikes me that between that function within Kruvi, but also, you know, the Catch a Break podcast, which is another one of your babies, um, yeah. you really are a believer in, I think they sort of call it the monkey chain. You know, someone's helping pull you up and you've got your hand down to pull the next person up. Um, and I, I love the old thing in Hollywood where, you know, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. It's right. almost that kind of a thing. It's like everybody is trying to do something. We all came in with a dream of telling a story and making a difference. All of us, right? So how do you help that, that, in in everyone where is that balance of of that so that's really where we come from and it's and it's an organic piece of who we are and and all of the pieces that we that we create no i i think that's wonderful because i think you know you you made this comment too with catch a break that i think you like other execs get get asked for coffee can i have a coffee and can i pick your brain jeanette can i have a coffee and and um you know, there's, there's a lot of that. And so how can you channel that? And you've got a, a brilliant lineup of, of colleagues who are now sort of involved with Catch a Break, like Shirley Davis. And I think that, um, you know, having execs who can give their time back to go to the trouble of doing something like Catch a Break that really talks to multiple topics um, in the business. It's, it's really worth tuning in for anybody who, you know, is watching this, um, this webinar. I, I highly recommend you bounce to Catch a Break and, and have a look. Um, just before we go to the Q&A, and I know Regina's um, there who will help us um, bring in questions from the audience. I know you are about to imminently start filming, which is very unusual um, and and you're at the forefront of a return to production. I'd love to just hear a little bit about that from you before we um, hear from uh, hear some questions. 
we're having fun. It's a, um, it's a puzzle. It's definitely a puzzle. Every day we take, it's, it's a project called Songbird. Um, it's a Michael Bay production that we're doing. And uh, it's a lot of the, the crew that worked on paranormal activity back in the day. And, um, you know, we created a space back then where, where we worked with found footage rules. And, and now we're creating a space where we're working with COVID rules. And um, it's, one step forward every day and then working with all of the unions to make sure that we are in compliance with everything that everybody's learning. And the thing is, is that we're, we're learning and discovering more about COVID and how to deal with it every day. So every time we think we've got it, we have to shift. And then we, we got it, okay, you have to shift. But we're doing it in partnership with all of our craftsmen who have come onto the project and um, the crew are, are simply stunning and amazing and are really stepping up to figure out how to solve this Rubik's Cube of a puzzle. And with the cast that we're starting to bring into it, um, where their comfortability level is with things and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And, and um, yeah, I'm really excited because it's, it's, uh, it's challenging. It's scary to a certain extent because you definitely have um, responsibility to keep people safe and to do things as best as possible and yeah. also sharing everything that we've learned with our counterparts at the unions and with uh, city and state um, offices because it's it's a uh, it's a doozy to try and do this yeah. while we're locked down it, and you are definitely the forefront I mean there is production that's that has started to occur in different territories around the world and I think you know the the world is watching those territories and I'm sure you feel there's a lot of eyes on you um yeah, watching to see who like I look at some of the other like Iceland and New Zealand and stuff like that and I'm like okay well that's great they have their their parameters but they're also pretty much COVID free right, right. and here we're not where our uptick is going again so there's a, you know, I got a call from the union yesterday um, that two of the people on another production um, that was a, a real, I believe it was a reality show, um, tested positive and were sent home. So, right. you know, it's definitely a serious thing that you've got to pay attention to and finding that balance, again, finding that balance, it's all about finding balance, right? So finding that balance yep. of how do you deal with the rules of COVID and how to move production forward safely and creatively. And what's really fun is, you know, the way that we embrace the people that we work with is um, we're all contributing to this and moving forward. And if it doesn't work for somebody, raise your hand and let's, let's figure it out. You know? Yeah. That communication is, is key. And I've heard too from, um, you know, Einar from, from the Iceland, um, you know, Invest Iceland, the film commission was talking about, you know, crew members there because obviously Iceland is returning to production and just how there is this mindset that, you know, this is my new uniform for work. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it, it's my mask, it is my gloves. And, and once you, you just have to be in that mindset and then it starts to become, I mean, it's become second nature now to walk outside with the mask on and now you're, you know, but if you're on a set style situation, it's also all of your interactivity and your distance. So look, I think it's um, uh, all the best. I think it's um, incredibly exciting that you're, you're moving forward. Um, Regina, I'm going to call on you to um, let us know if we've had some questions. Fantastic. Yeah, we did indeed. Um, and I'll just, I'll just bring them on. So hello, everybody. Um, and please bring on your questions. Um, we have a whole half hour um, to, to answer them. And we, we actually have one question. Um, directly about uh, COVID as well. And that is, um, do you think the industry will change after COVID and will it change in a good or in a bad way? Do you have any opinions, uh, opinions on that? Both of you, actually. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think from, from all of the guidelines I've read uh, and the protocols and the white papers, I feel like I've read about 30 of them <laughs> to date. Um, actually, it's got to be more than that. I realize we've got more than 50 of them listed on our on our members section of our website um the thing that has struck me the most is uh you know possibly a reduced number of people but uh definitely a longer time taken to to do things uh and also you know unfortunately environmentally the the waste aspect of of um of working in a post-covid world is going to take us a couple of decades back, I feel, um, you know, no more buffets, no more help yourself. 
uh, to coffee and tea. Everything is, is pre-packaged lunches, um, lots of gloves, lots of masks. Um, so I think, I think things will change. The question around when we get a vaccine is probably the most critical one. Uh, I think once that happens, there will start to be quite a big shift. I know at one point there was sort of talk about doing antibody testing. Uh, I think a lot of work needs to be done to really understand the efficacy of that. Uh, but I certainly see a change. You know, I was on a, a webinar several months ago uh, and somebody uh, mentioned, and I, it's terrible because I would like to attribute them to this, but I, I'm now trying to remember who it was who mentioned this analogy. Um, but it was a really interesting one. Uh, their comment was 9-11 happened and we all made the shift. Now at airports, we separate our liquids and we, our gels and it's all, it's all normal. Um, so to post the pandemic, there will be a new normal that sort of rises up and we will come to be accustomed to it. Um, that's, that's my two cents, Jenna. Yeah, I completely agree. I would say that it's going to be, you know, a year, year and a half, however long it's going to take for us to get through the, you know, the big curve of this and come up with a vaccine. And then um, I think some of those things will relax a little bit, but but the cognizant awareness of keeping things clean and you know the way that we handle stuff and the hand washing, I think that's gonna last with this generation and moving forward for a long time, which is not a bad thing. Um, and other positions and roles are gonna develop. I mean, the, the onset COVID safety monitor is one of them that's, that's come up. So there's definitely um, some of those pieces. And, and I would say, you know, the shorter hours, because it, it sucks wearing a mask and working for that long. Like your peripheral is a little skewed and, and it gets in the way and it's hot and you're breathing in your, your carbon monoxide. And, you know, so there's gotta be breaks that, which is not necessarily a bad thing. And there's gotta be a little bit of a shorter day, which means you might be able to have a little bit more time with your family, not necessarily a bad thing, you know? So I, I look at it and I think, okay, you know, we can, figure this out. It's just another set of challenges that we've hurdled before in other ways that we're going to attack it now as a community, as a film community, and figure out how to share that information and move forward. Yeah, if there's one thing this community is, it's innovative um, and problem solving. Uh, you would know firsthand, Jeanette, I mean, you, you have, there are fires that start on production and you <laughs> job is to put them out. Um, you know, I think from AFCI's perspective, um, something that's incredibly critical is to ensure that just as we don't want diversity to, to sort of drop off the table because everyone's focusing on, on health. I mean, health is obviously paramount, but we, we must continue having conversations about diversity and it must be at the forefront. Um, so too, for us, you know, arts and culture must stay at the forefront as a whole. Um, it's times like these, and I think I repeat this on every webinar I do, that, that budgets are cut uh, for our particular sector. And what needs to be understood is the incredible importance of this sector economically. Because mm -hmm. when you think about other sectors, there are very few that, you know, come employ pretty instantly hundreds of people many locals on, you know, they are, they are high paying jobs. There are vehicles that are rented, there are apartments that are rented. Um, everyone does their shopping locally, people go out to dinner. I mean, I, I think back to some examples from my time in, in Queensland when major shows would come in and, and sort of take over a whole town. Um, mm -hmm. And that economic injection is incredibly important for recovering economies. And I think, you know, we are seeing around the world, there will be recovering economies. So it's important for us not to lose sight of how important um, the screen sector is in that. In well, that the space. good news about that is, you know, with all of the streaming services that are out there, uh, the content is needed. We need more content now than ever before. So the the that desire to have new shows, new voices, new ways of telling stories, innovation uh, is is there, and we can meet it with the technology and we can meet it with the demand and now we need to figure out how to maneuver around some of the um, issues that are happening with COVID and safety and and do it in a, in a cohesive team way with all of the partners or, um, from various different 
organizations and industries and unions and countries and you know uh, soon we'll get back on an airplane and we'll be able to you know film in other places and you know we'll we will figure it out oh, agreed that's wonderful thank you for that um we have one more question as well um so you said before that we all came into the industry with a dream for telling a story which is really beautiful i think um have you had people who helped you uh, into the industry it's actually also a question to both of you yes uh, i've had some lovely mentors along the way and sometimes they're people that you didn't really realize were a mentor until uh, afterwards. It's just you hear their voices in your head, um, particular things that they would say and particular things that they would do and um, some of the unlikely people. But it's, it's you know, if, if you go into a job thinking, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to learn what I can and I'm going to give back to the next person and pass it on you are a mentor to that next person and and passing that torch on um so many people like when i when i was really young and coming up in the industry i was asked to write a manual for a company that i was working for about how i do what i do and this was many years ago in my early 20s and um and i uh, asked some other people who had a similar position as me if they if i could ask them some questions so that i can could collaborate and get um, a couple different opinions on on something and uh, most of them said yes and one person said no because they said um, this is my proprietary uh, way of doing things and if I tell you this and other people do it then you know I won't have job security and I kind of laughed and I said you know it's um, a dime a dozen there's so many people that can do your job and it's not about um, you knowing how to connect A to B to C. It's about your personality and how well you take care of people and how you respond and um, how you try to, nobody has all the answers. You've got to work as a team with everybody and you've got to raise your hand and say, I'm stuck, I need help, hot potato, whatever it is um, to move things forward. And if you go in with that attitude of, you know, we're all figuring this out and we're handing handing torches to the next generation and, and um, acknowledging the people that have come before us and how, how the curve has changed so much from when, you know, the industry used to be to where it's going now and uh, how do we keep the momentum going into a positive direction, then, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, really cool things that can come out of that and a lot of great inspiration and voices. I think that's a fantastic answer. Um, you know, I, I have to say the, um, the most important thing, um, you know, I, I, is that giving back? Um, you, you know, I think our industry had a, had, had a reputation for being full of sort of senior executives or creatives who would throw their mobile phone. Um, and I remember, you know, I'd hear sort of horrific stories and think to myself in, in my former life before I moved into this sector in sort of my, my corporate life, which has always been sort of related in many ways. I started my career in advertising, but you know, I would think to myself, God, if I ever behaved that way, I mean, I'd, I'd be fired. I'd be yeah. fired and I would, you know, I'd lose my job that day. And yet somehow people were sort of, there was a permission for people to behave really badly. Um, and I think, you know, the most important thing is to, to break the cycle of, well, I was treated that way. So now I'm the top dog and I will, you know, assert my, uh, my power and behave the way my boss used to treat me. Uh, you know, I think this having an approach to, to everything that is collaborative, um, for me, having a team around me that is full of people who are better at things than I am is really important to never be threatened by someone who can do something better than you, because quite frankly, that makes, everything better you don't want yeah. to be filled with a, a room of people who are like you because then everyone's bringing the same thing to the table yeah completely agree wonderful um and have you helped uh, anyone you know sort of in in return so to say um and can you share a story um about that when you sort of pass that sort of mentor mentor mentality on to somebody else gosh i mean i 
I feel like you do that on all of your productions. <laughs> it's, an it's an ongoing thing. It never, it never ends. And it's something that I really enjoy. And I always, I'm looking for someone who has the sparkle in their eye of, I want to learn and I want to be um, the best that I can. And I'm just going to keep trying. That's, that's what I look for when I want to hire somebody in entry level positions and in, in things is just that, that eagerness to learn and to be part of a team. No. Yeah. And I think sometimes those sort of mentoring and you don't want to make this sound condescending, but the people you, you hire, as you just said, Jeanette, within your own organization or, um, you know, a, a team are often ones that it's not just the job that they do, but there are the side conversations that you have. Um, I've always thought it's incredibly important to have open conversations with staff that, that are like this is this is a position description this is the job if there are things that interest you outside the job let's talk about them you know i i well appreciate at some point you are going to leave the nest to do something else if there's no opportunity for you to move up so let's let's talk about how we can provide the best environment for you here to keep you here as long as possible and to keep you happy and have you doing wonderful things for this organization before we have to you know possibly lose you i mean hopefully we don't have to lose you but if we do let's let's do it under a environment that's sort of a you felt fulfilled rather than cranky um yep. because that's that's what we all want from our, our workplace yeah i mean that's one of the things that i like about catchlight studios and and this new um adventure that i'm on with my friends you know there's there's five of us it's um rick osako marcy brown jessica Milanofi, jason clark and myself and um we really came together to say look we want to do it different than the way that we've been doing it for the last umpteen years working for other people. And we went in it and we're all equal partners and we're all splitting up and taking on things that are partly our strengths and partly not our strengths. So the, so that we're learning and, and figuring it out. And, um, you know, the, the notion of like, Hey, um, I need a little help over here. I don't understand this. Or can you walk me through this? And then someone will come in or, you know, just just had another baby. And so she wanted to be able to adjust some of her hours and to be able to do that and work around the schedule and work around all the COVID and all of that stuff. It's been, it's been really great figuring out how to, how to make a collaborative team moving forward, dealing with multiple companies and learning and leaning into our strengths, but also going out onto a ledge of like, we've never been here before let's explore this and what is this? And we're all afraid, but we're all gonna just keep moving forward because we've got each other's backs and no one's gonna throw anybody under the bus. Yeah, that's terrific. That, that trust that exists between the five of you is, um, is something that's so incredibly important. And like you say, not being afraid to, to put your hand up because no one has all the answers. I mean, that's so true. I've you know, spoken to you know, a number of people in their career who have really felt defined by their job and I, I've been guilty of that too your self-worth is sort of attached to this thing and you have to remind yourself that, you know, everyone is replaceable. And that doesn't mean there's another you coming in. It just means there's someone who can go through the motions and do your job. Maybe it takes two people to do the work that you do because yeah. you, you know, you don't sleep and you're so passionate and you're so quick. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there is a uniqueness that everyone has, which makes them of course who they are. Um, you know, but, but, you know, it, it's important to, keep reminding yourself of, of uh, who you are and what you bring to the table that is especially unique. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Jeanette, you just said um, that, you know, you like to do things differently. Uh, can you talk a bit more about what that exactly means, doing things different? I, when I first got into running production, um, you know, there's no manual when someone says like, do you want to run production for a company? There's, there's no real job description that's sort of like in a published in a book that you can study to, so you got to kind of feel it out. And I've done everything in my life very intuitively. And so when I work with people, I, uh, I, I give them parameters like clearly you have to give us a budget you have to give us a cash flow you have to give us these things that you know when we do something forward but if it's easier for you to have this piece 
in the cost report like this because that's the way you think and you want to do it that way. As long as I understand why you're doing it, that's fine. You don't have to do it the way that I want you to do it in terms, as long as the end result is the same. So I, everybody, I acknowledge that everybody thinks differently and they problem solve and go through, um, uh, you know, some, like I have, one of my favorite accountants, she has to think things out loud. She has to talk about it out loud. And I could have a conversation with her. That's not really a conversation. It's literally her speaking at me, but she's talking it out loud. And at the end of the conversation, she'll wrap it up and walk off and be on her merry way. And I barely said anything. I listened to her <laughs> speaking it, but she was working it out for herself. She can't do it silently. She has to say it out loud. Right. So my job in, and the way that I like to work with people is to lean into where their strengths are and embrace it. And as long as the end result is something that everybody can live with, just embrace that and go with that. And so it's, it's a matter of finding the, um, I always, I always joke and I always tell people it's sort of like match.com. When you put a, a group of people together into a, into a movie, you know, you're, there's so many people who are really good at their job. It comes down to personality, right? Does that oh, yeah. get along with that production designer, get along with that costume designer, get along with that AD? Do they all have the same vision as the director? Do, do they, are they good at hiring people in their departments? Does everyone have the same energy moving forward? You know, it's that kind of a thing where I like to look at it intuitively and find that, again, the balance, you find the balance, right? It's a, that's a really good comment. I mean, when, when production comes together, it's suddenly, it's like having a massive family reunion, except, you, you know, and you've never met, um, you know, a couple of people have met, and then you all have to hang out and be in each other's spaces for 12 plus hours a day, you know, yeah. in strange environments, basically problem solving, because I feel like production is, you know, best laid plans, but it is inherently also problem solving. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a question uh, specifically actually about that. Um, uh, and that is uh, from Leslie. Um, she, she asks, I heard uh, SAG was not happy with the releases for Songbird. Uh, can you discuss how you're resolving the issues so you and SAG can continue to work in harmony? Sure. So SAG is the Screen Actors Guild. And we released a post uh, a week and a half ago, something like that, where we put out to the world for um, anyone to record a little piece of um, where they're at in COVID and what it's like. And, you know, there was a, a few action items and anyone could record whatever they wanted. And um, we asked them to sign a release ahead of time so that we had the ability to use it in the movie because the, the movie is, um, it's, a, it's a love story set in the future in a couple of years and COVID is still, uh, it's actually worse in our movie, so God forbid. <laughs> Um, so we wanted to capture what was going on in the world and SAG didn't want us to have a pre-negotiated contract before people uh, submitted, but we had, <laughs> we had over 20 something thousand people submit. Oh, wow. Um, Kudos. Yeah. I mean, we are, we're, we're like on 2000 going through it right now. Like it is calling through all of these, um, responses from around the world and in and, and some in native language. And um, it's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, we came to an accord with SAG and they uh, are supposed to release something shortly saying that it's okay. But what, what the solution was, was um, we just don't ask for the release beforehand. If we want to use your piece, then, then we ask for the release afterwards when we actually put it in the film. So that's a simple fix. Yes. Mm -hmm. it was that's amazing between us yeah yeah but that's phenomenal that a number of responses um yeah it really i think the the story that we're telling and the outreach that we have with it is really striking a chord with people and um and i uh i'm excited because the the script just keeps getting better and better and better and better and the fact that we can involve the world in pieces of it is is from los angeles still in lockdown is still pretty cool that's remarkable. Mm. That's wonderful. Thanks. Um, and we have a few more questions on Kruby uh, specifically. Um, so first of all, is it, uh, or in which territory does the tool work? Is it a global kind it's of database? Global. 
Yeah. It's global. And I just, you'll remember this, um, you know, we're, we're constantly learning and adjusting and, and, you know, figuring this out as we go along because, um, you know, we, we built it from the ground up. It's not, it's owned privately by us and, and no one else. So of course, you know, some things we think of and some things we don't. And one of the things we didn't think of was that the uh, Nordic areas have different um, symbols in their alphabet. And uh, some of the people over there were having a hard time figuring out how to fill it out completely because our, uh, programming wasn't allowing for them to have those in there. And so um, Camille and Sandra figured out how to fix that. And, uh, and away we went and made that adjustment. But yes, you know, it'll keep morphing and changing as we go along because it is global. And, and there are um, what we used to have as required categories in some areas like city and state is now no longer a required thing because not everywhere in the world has a city and state and you can't fill that out. So Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tough trying to create something that fits for the globe. Um, so, so kudos. Um, even you know, even like down to like names of departments and what you call people mm -hmm. are slightly different in certain places. So we've had to, you know, take those into consideration and morph a little bit of what those, what those are and how they fit and, you know, how to, how to find that perfect way of communicating between different cultures. And unfortunately, yeah. it's only in English right now. We haven't we haven't cracked changing it into another language, but um, it does account for uh, the entire world. So, mm. and we have a question from from Deborah uh, in Jamaica, and she asks: um, We here in Jamaica are excited about getting our vibrant, uh, exciting Caribbean Caribbean stories told. Uh, our small screen industry is dynamic uh, but growing. And CRUI is an excellent means to share information with the world. Uh, we would like to have a dis or, yeah, some discussions with the unions in particular to make our casts, casts um, crews and craftsmen and women available for consideration. Uh, do you have any specific words of advice um, for that? Um, well, I, you know, please feel free to email me after this and we'll, we'll set something up and we would, would love to have you part of the database and the more, you know, we try to um, highlight different people and different territories and different companies as well, because it's also um, an area that we haven't grown in there is companies like I, you know, I was joking with Marcy at one point and I was filming in Malaysia and I needed a tent and I had no idea where to find a tent over there. There was no a directory of like film stuff in where I was to be able to like, oh, I can look this up and find this tent. So, um, you know, eventually we want to expand and get into um, vendors who want to help the film and television industry and want to be listed in there so that it makes it like an easier stop for things like that. Like when you're in the Caribbean, like who, do you, who are the best people to rent particular things from? If I wanted a, a boat that I could sleep crew on, if I wanted whatever. So it's not just about finding the people because that's a huge part of it and definitely a, um, a, a driving factor of this, but it's, but there's also the support around all of that so it's the it's the companies it's the film commissions it's the it's everybody that helps bring together these these companies that you know can be small or large and creating these projects and um, I'm, I'm happy to have separate discussions with whomever whenever and and introduce and, and connect people with places so. she's good at that she's good at that <laughs> I love doing Yes, so Deborah, feel free to, to email uh, Jeanette after. That's, that's really wonderful. And is it for free to be part of CREW? So uh, to join as a crew member is free right now because we're in COVID. We did uh, want to put $1, um, $1 per month in for people because it gives you a sense of ownership to something. It's that, you know, um, I've paid for something. I I'm uh, invested in it and I'm going to get something out, but we wanted to make it affordable to people um, to be able to, uh, to join. So we didn't want to have um, finances be a reason why they didn't join. So um, for the most part, it's $1 per month and um, that pays for all of the hosting and all of the um, support staff and, and people that yeah. are, that are working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how is CREWI financed is another question. 
It was finance with uh, sweat, tears, love, and a lot of uh, uh, time sitting in a, in a little office with our friends, um, dreaming of what this could be. And, and you know, what I, used to, I, I like to say two popsicle sticks and a roll of duct tape. And, and, uh, and we, we just decided that we were gonna do it and we figured out a way and did it, did it ourselves, so. Independently owned and operated. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And um, which has been your favorite project so far and why? Or did you have any nightmare project as well and why? Can you just share share a few more stories? Uh, um, well, one of my favorite, I mean, I have so many favorite projects because I've worked on, so I've been blessed to be able to work on so many projects over the years, but um, probably in the last 12, 13 years or so. Um, I really loved working on Insidious because it was the first project that we created a crew profit pool. And um, the entire crew was bonused out over $1.5 million split between all of the members of the crew because it did so well in the box office. And I want to bet with Lee Wanell that who was the writer of that and he's since gone on to direct and he just did Invisible Man and stuff that um, we would cross 30 million at the box office and that he would have to clean my house. So he still owes me that. But um, <laughs> we talked about it the other day. So. Um, but uh, that one gave me an, an immense amount of pride to know that you can change things and that you can make a difference. And even though you might be working on a low budget project and everybody is putting in blood, sweat and tears into it, that in the success of that, you can also share that with all of the craftsmen that came to the table to make that possible. That's tremendous. Jess, do you have anything to share? On that question? Um, look, I, I can sort of share, I suppose, from a film commission point of view, I, I think, you know, a lot of the, the crazy stories I had as a film commissioner outside of dealing with policy and regulations and trying to attract production and business development, you'd sometimes have some crazy experiences trying to attract a production to your territory. I think one of my strangest ones was working with a production that was looking to shoot in, uh, in, Queensland that was interested in in bringing tigers in that were trained and you know Australia has very strict quarantine regulations and I remember having conversations with the federal government quarantine authority about tigers and the response was look they're not native and you can't bring them in they're an exotic animal um, and so I hung up the phone and then called them again and said, look, is there any way that we could possibly do this? There's got to be some possible manner in which we could facilitate. And I think there was some opportunity at that point in time for a, it had to be approved by the federal government, but it was a, a breeding program. It had to be attached to a breeding program. And it just so happened that the studios that we were looking at also owned a theme park down the road that had tigers. So I spent like my morning kind of doing match.com for tigers, um, trying to work out if the tigers coming in had been fixed, if the ones at the zoo were fixed and if we could possibly, I mean, I got, I got sort of as far as making phone calls be, and then the, you know, the project sort of went dead for us and it, it shot elsewhere. But it was one of those examples of walking into the office and having no idea what it is that you're going to have to do that day. Um, tiger matchmaking. I think that's what I love about this industry is you never know, never know what's going to come your way. No. Yeah. That, that is, that's the fun, that's the fun part yeah. um, is the surprise and it's the, and it's the problem solving. Um, yeah. I think this is, this is beautiful to, to wrap this up. Um, I'm just going to bring Helen back in. Yes. For a few final words. Um, please also turn your audio. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. I'm so happy the two of you came in my way in St. Petersburg last year. Thank you for a fantastic webinar for sharing experiences and also this very good information by Kruvi. And I can tell you we have WIF members from Africa, Canada, US and Scandinavia on board listening to this. And I really encourage uh, the WIF members to, to have a look at this, encourage your members to sign up for Kruvi because it is a way also to connect. And that's part of our mission as WIF is to connect with each other. So thank you. And I'm the only one, and Regina can give you applause. So we have to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. Thanks.
This was the last, thank you. This was the last webinar for this before summer. So I want to wish you everyone a happy summer and we will be back in the fall with new webinars from all over the world. So have a nice summer and goodbye. And thank you again, ladies. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Regina. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you.